نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله الطيب electricity 
If electricity is cut, there's no prospect for light. There's no prospect for any electronic device through which people can get outside help. And the second thing that a professional thief would do is he would cut the telephone wire. Why? Because he knows that with the electricity cut and with the telephone wire cut, the likelihood of the people inside getting help is very little. And all they then have to do is do the best they can do themselves. My dear brothers, when the enemy of Islam wanted to steal from the house of Islam the real treasure, he made sure that he cut two wires. And the first wire was the power source of the Ummah. And that wire was the connection of the Ummah to the Nabi. If you disconnect that source of the relationship between a Nabi and Ummati, then Ummati is left on his own. And the second wire which he cut, the telephone wire, that wire was the connection which the Ummah had with the Awliya. Why? If you cut these two wires off, the connection with the Prophet and the Awliya, then we are left to ourselves to fight the enemy. If you look at our hundred years history, especially the last hundred years, you will see a huge movement in the whole history of Islam that had two designs. Number one, to sever our connection with Rasulullah. And when I say connection, I don't mean outward connection. You can behave in the outward however you like. But the connection of the Ummah in 1300 years with the Prophet wasn't just an external connection where they just imitated him, where they just followed him on the external. They followed him internally to the extent that they formed a connection between themselves and Rasulullah. And today, as a result of that conspiracy, you have people who follow on the external, but on the internal, they have no connection with Rasulullah. Likewise, the connection with the awliya, it was designed to be a medium of connection with Rasulullah. So therefore, we find ourselves in this dilemma. But the problem with a lot of people who retain those values that were designed to keep the connection going between Rasulullah and his Ummah, such as the celebration of Milad, the problem is we have turned the Milad or similar ceremonies, even Yarmishi, whatever, we have turned these into rituals into customary practices. The object is, you come, you hear a lecture, you go. But this is not just the object of these Milad or Nabi or Gami or whatever program. The object is that you use these functions as a platform to strengthen your internal relationship with Rasulullah And if that internal relationship isn't progressing, then you're not really benefiting properly from coming to these functions. You get sawab, no doubt. You get ajal, no doubt. But the real benefit is to strengthen that benefit with Rasulullah Why? Because this day is not a ritual day. I have been asked to shed some light on the legitimacy of this day. This day is not a ritual where we just do it for a bit of sawab. If the object of celebrating Milad, Gyarmi or whatever was sawab, then there are many other ways we could get sawab. Does anyone understand? If the object of celebrating these functions was simply sawab, then there are many other routes which we could use to celebrate 
or to gain sawab. But no. Allah's style. Whose style? Allah's style is that He specifies days in the calendar. Just repeat this. Allah's style is that He specifies days in the 365 days are all the same as far as we are concerned. But not as far as Allah is concerned. Allah has given eminence of some days over other days. And it would be foolish for anyone to assume that 365 days are the same in the old calendar year. Maybe scientifically <coughs> you would say 365 days are the same. But in Islam or in the Quran and the Sunnah, it would be the utmost degree of foolishness to consider 365 days as the same days, as the same status, as the same calendar. Why? Some days have eminence over other days. And remember we're talking about days. Because some people say, why do you specify day of Mila? Why day? Just do it generally. Uh, uh, you should uh, uh, specify the, all days of the calendar. Why a particular day? Why the 12th of Rabiu Nabal? Why Monday? Why in Rabiu Nabal? Well, there's no harm in celebrating Mila 365 days a year. But the Ahl Sunnah specify because specification is also the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah educates us in the Quran and says, listen, you may not understand the significance of 365 days, but let me teach you. Allah teaches us in the Quran. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى And we set Musa السلام, with clear signs. With clear signs. Musa, we set with Musa our signs, clear signs. What was the object of sending signs? And أخرج قومك من الظلمات إلى النور. The object of those signs was to take his people out and أخرج قومك to take your people من الظلمات إلى النور from darkness into so the object of the signs of Musa was to take out of darkness into and then Allah says and tell them to remember the days of Allah the days of which days of Allah? Allah doesn't have a day. Allah is free from days. But those days, Mufassirin say, those days in which Allah bestowed His mercy, His rahmah, His blessing upon the Bani Israel, Allah says, don't consider those days to be ordinary days. You must not consider them to be ordinary but remember them not as ordinary days but as days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now imagine, وَزَكِّرُهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ Not yom is single, ayyam is plural. وَزَكِّرُهُمْ And there's mubala in the sila. There's an emphasis in the sila. Babar zikr kuru. Tell them again and again to remember the days of Allah. Why? Even though the ni'mah was bestowed on one day and 
you are being told to remember that day again and again. The object is that when you remember that day again and again, even though the ni'mah came and it went on that day, but by you remembering that day, not only will you get sawab, Allah says, in if you remember the ni'mah of Allah and do shukr, Allah will give you more of that. So when we remember the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are remembering His blessings upon us. And Allah says, Ayatina. Those days are not ordinary days. They are ayats, our signs. So therefore, we conclude from the verse of the Quran that days of the Quran are verses of Allah. They are signs of Allah. Not only that, they are signs of Allah and by specifying them and by remembering them, we are following the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've been told that uh, Asan Namaz is now due, so we'll take a break for Asan Namaz and inshallah we'll carry on. <laughs> أن أخرج قومك من الظلمات إلى النور وذكرهم بقيام الله صدق الله العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الله الموجود والكرم وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم وصل عليه so before Asr, we had concluded that to specify a day in the calendar to remember Allah's ni'mah, Allah's blessings, is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It would be inherently foolish to consider 365 days to be the same. When Allah has categorically said that remember the days of Allah, and of course by the days of Allah we mean those days which Allah has bestowed His blessings upon people. May I bring your attention to all the different blessings of Allah? No, I can't. There are so many that if we try to count the blessings of Allah, we can't. But one thing I can say, that the greatest blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for humans was the advent of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So if Allah is asking us to remember the days upon which he favored Bani Israel for the favors that he sent on those specific, specified days, it means that therefore there is no greater blessing than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And so therefore specifying his day is also within the constitution of the Quran and the Sunnah. However, what people say, and I would like to focus my discussion based on the objections that are leveled against the celebration of Modi. What they say is that you can specify them but the specification of birthday is wrong. Do you understand the question? No, you don't understand the question. It's supposed to give me the answer. Well, you've got to bear with me. I mean, I'm not just going to ramble on for the next half an hour and just say, all right, it's one of the I'll see you later. What was the question? Marvelous. I think you all need a cup of tea. <laughs> Right, we were talking about, from the Qur'an I established, 
quite clearly that to specify a day in which blessing has been given by Allah and to remember Allah on that day and to remember that day is part of the ayn, the constitution of the Quran. The next question is, what about birthday? Some people say, yeah, you know. In fact, when I was in the, the South Pacific two years ago, one alim said to me, well, we celebrate Sira and you celebrate Milad. Sira is the Kul and Milad is Juz. Now I know some of you don't understand that. Kul means absolute, Juz means part. They say, you celebrate Milad al Nabi and we celebrate Sira al Nabi. We celebrate Sira encompasses his whole life, Milad al Nabi only encompasses his birth. Therefore, Sirat al Nabi is better than Milad al Nabi. I said, no, Milad al Nabi is still better than Sirat al Nabi. Why? If you didn't have Milad al Nabi, you wouldn't have Sirat al Nabi. <laughs> so, although Milad is Juz and Sirat is Kul, but this Kul is Mokuf upon the Juz. If you don't have the Juz, you won't have the Kul. So, therefore, we celebrate Milad not because it's just a custom or a ritual. Why do we celebrate? Why do we specify birthday? Where did this word birthday come from? Birth. Birth. The word birthday. This isn't some alim who concocted a, a day just to uh, promote Islam for dawah purposes. This word birthday. Which day? Well, I need to know you're actually awake. Which day? Which day? This word birthday. Where does it come from? It doesn't come from the fatwa of an alim. It doesn't come from a weak hadith. It comes from the Quran itself. So we specify days in remembering the blessings of Allah. Rasulullah was the greatest blessing. But when we specify birthdays, Allah educates us on the issue of birth. On the issue of birth, day. Now let's see from the Quran. Oh Allah, you tell us, what is the significance of birthday? Allah says, listen, your birthday may be insignificant, but don't consider the birthday of my Anbiya to be insignificant. Why? From the Quran. You can pick up any translation from the Quran. You can pick up any uh, uh, tafsir, you will find the same translation, word for word. Allah says in the Quran, وَسَلَامٌ Upon my servant Yahya salam. Which servant? Yahya. Salam upon him. Bear in mind this word salam. Salam has different meanings. Maybe another day we'll talk on this word salam. But you must bear in mind salam is a form of blessing from Allah. And Allah specifies this salam. Upon Yahya salam, on which days? He selects three days in the calendar. Yawma ulida wa yawma yamutu wa yawma yubhathu hayya. Don't consider 365 days the same because these three days as far as Yahya salam is concerned are no ordinary days, the day he was born, i.e. his birthday, the day he will die and the day he will be resurrected. All three days are days when Allah sends salam upon him. Allah sends salam upon him? But doesn't Allah already send salam? Of course he does. In certain parts of the Quran, Allah specifies the Anbiya by name and generally he reads, mutlaqan he reads, he says, Salam. Salamun ala Nuhin fil Salam.
سلام على موسى وارون سلام على Allah specifies Anbiya and says I send Salaam upon these individual Anbiya 365 days a year Mutlaqan, there's no restriction of day 365 days a year I send Salaam upon them and in one juncture here he mentions them by name and at one juncture he says Salaam ala al Salam upon all my Rasuls. So you can see Allah's style. Sometimes He sends Salam 365 days a year with name by name. Sometimes He sends Salam upon all of them collectively 365 days a year. And sometimes He specifies their birthday. Salam upon their birthday. Where is this written? Yawma Vulida. You pick up any translation. What do you say? There's no dispute on translation. Even some people say there's a dispute on the meaning of this. Yawma Vulida. Only one meaning. Birthday. Allah says salam upon him specifically on his birthday. Just Yahya alayhi salam? No. Isa alayhi salam also says. Was salam alayya yawma vulidtu wa yawma amu. Don't think my birthday, Isa is saying this, don't think my birthday is an ordinary day in this year. Why? It may be ordinary for you, but for me, Isa is that's not an ordinary day because on my birthday, Allah sends salam upon me. So Allah educates us in the Quran that don't take the birthday of a Nabi to be an ordinary day. Mutlaqan, I send salam upon all of them all the time. But I specify salam on their birthday to teach you, to educate you that if I have elevated their birthday and sent salam upon them, therefore if you want to follow me, you should also elevate their birthday day and send salam upon them that is why the quran teaches us to treat the birthdays of anbiya with reverence and what is the best way to celebrate these birthdays it's by sending salam upon them why because that's the way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specified the birthday of anbiya that is why the eminence of the day of Jummah is associated to a number of factors but one of the factors of the eminence of the day of Juma is because Fihi Hulida Adam it is the birthday of Adam so therefore even the Prophet gave eminence to Friday why because it was the birthday of Adam I ask you if the birthday of Yahya is a day of eminence in the Quran if the birthday of Isa is a day of eminence in the Quran. If the birthday of Adam has been extolled as Friday by Rasulullah then why is it that someone has a problem when it comes to the birthday of Muhammad Rasulullah? But as far as the Ahl Sunnah are concerned, the birthday of the Prophet is no ordinary day. In fact, it is the best day in the calendar. It is not just another blessed day, it is the best day in the calendar. By the way, me and you actually have two birthdays. How many birthdays? But Rasulullah sallallahu has three birthdays. Did you know that? Me and you have how many birthdays? Not in the year. One is our biological birthday. 
That differs from person to person. But there's another day that we were born. When Adam salam came on this earth from Jannah, from when he arrived on this earth from his loins in Arafat, Allah extracted, Allah extracted the arwah of the entire human race from within him. This is in Hadith. This is not me relaying the Jack Lorry to you. This is in Hadith. That the entire souls of the human race were in Adam were in can you imagine the caliber of Adam that he has the ability to sustain the entire human race or the arwah of the entire human race in his body and the day that he extracted the souls of humans on the day of Arafat that was the birthday of our Ruh. So we have a Ruhani birthday and we have a Jismani birthday, a physical birthday. Or should I say in English? We have a spiritual birthday and we have a... I know it's Sunday afternoon, it's 5 o'clock and you're all on relaxation mode. But do follow because I need to know that you're actually following. I don't need you to say SubhanAllah, MashaAllah. It's like uh, uh, the joke of this uh, uh, island, he was delivering a speech and he was shouting his head off as, as nine times out of ten is the case. And then the people were saying, oh, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. And this person came in late and he said, oh, I missed the speech, what a tragedy. So he asked one of the person, he says, how was the speech? He said, the speech was excellent. He says, really? He says, it was a brilliant speech. He said, so what was it about? He said, I don't know what it was about, it was brilliant. <laughs> the way you were carrying on, I'm getting worried. That's what you're going to say. Oh, it was a brilliant speech, but you don't even remember. You need to follow what I'm saying so that you actually see that this is leading somewhere. It's not just a, 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 a story here and a story there once upon a time and then we will live happy ever after. It's designed to make you think of the significance of this day. Right, and so what was I saying? We have a spiritual birthday and we have a physical birthday. Our spiritual birthday came first and on that basis everyone in this room is the same age. But physical birthday came after. However, when it comes to Rasulullah he doesn't have two birthdays. He has how many birthdays? Why? Because our existence began when we emerged from within Adam But Rasulullah's existence existed even before he emerged through Adam Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before he created the entire universe before he created the law before he created the sun before he created the moon before he created the stars, the first thing that Allah did was to celebrate the birthday of Muhammad Rasulullah. So which birthday was that? He was born in Rabi Ulawal in, in the all those years to come. No, he has three birthdays. The first birthday was celebrated. Look how it was celebrated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the qalam. And he created the qalam and he said to the qalam, Uktu, write. The qalam said, what shall I write? The words of the Hadith are the Qalam was first. So, Allah created the Qalam first and said, Write. So then the Qalam wrote, ma kana wa ma yakun. The, the, the pen wrote that which had happened and that which was about to happen to the Day of Judgment. So, if the pen was first, what did it write before? There was nothing before the pen other than Nur e Muhammad. So, because Nur e Muhammad existed, Allah said, O oh pen, write the taqdeer, the kismet of the entire universe later, 
first talk about the birth of Muhammad Rasulullah So therefore And with us, normally the rule is that we exist first then we have attributes. For example, your Imam Sahib, he existed first, then he became Imam. You existed first, then you became a student. Your attributes come second, first comes your existence, right? Everyone following? Your attributes come second, your existence comes first. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indicated to us that the nature of my existence the nature of my existence was such that not only did I exist before Adam not only did I exist before Adam but I was even a Nabi before Adam alayhi salam Kuntu Nabiya wa Adam bain al mahi wa teen not only did I exist before Adam alayhi salam I was a Nabi now tell me Nabuwa is an attribute Nabuwa is a is a sift. Nabuwa is a sift. Rasulullah is saying, yes, my attribute existed even before Adam a.s. So if his attribute existed before Adam a.s., he is indicating that not only did I exist before Adam a.s., my attribute existed before Adam a.s. So therefore, when the Ahlul Sunnah specify the day of Milad, it is in conformity with the constitution of the Quran and Sunnah that we know that the day upon which he was born was a day of reverence and a day of maghfirah and a day of blessing not only to Muslims. This is the beautiful thing. We think that this is limited only to Muslims. But the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ is of such significance that if it is the subject of happiness even by a non-Muslim, even the non-Muslim benefits from the birthday of Rasulullah. <laughs> Am I saying this or is this something that is again within the constitution of the Quran and Sunnah? The Prophet ﷺ, this is a, 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 a hadith which you can find in uh, uh, Bukhari, otherwise known as the famous hadith of Tuaiba, where Abu Lahab, you know Abu Lahab? Does anyone know where he is at the moment? www.jahannam.com Is there any doubt? Some people are certified Jahannamis, he's a chartered Jahannami. Yeah. Yeah. No one doubts at this moment in time where Abu Lahab is. Abu Lahab is in Jahannam. But when one of his relatives saw him in a dream, when one of his relatives saw him in a dream <coughs> to see a kafir after his death to see his rule in a dream is quite possible just because they're in Jahannam that doesn't mean they don't have the ability to communicate if Allah wants them to communicate they can communicate from Jahannam to people of this world the hadith in Bukhari teaches us this why? because just because you're in Jahannam telecommunications are still possible so Abu Lahab speaks to someone who is living, who hasn't died. And his relative asks him, Oh Abu Lahab, how are you? He said, I'm very bad. I'm in a terrible state. Why? I'm in Jahannam. Of course I'm terrible. However, on Mondays, I suck my finger. And when I suck my finger, I am given relief, coolness from the, the fire of Jahannam. And it is written, why? He was given coolness from sucking his finger because when he was doing tawaf of the Kaaba, when he was doing tawaf of the Kaaba, his slave girl ran to him and said, Oh, Mullah, your, your brother has given birth to a son. And when he heard this news out of happiness of the birth of Rasulullah 
out of sheer happiness, he lifted his finger and he said to the slave girl, Go, I free you from the disabled. And Allah liked that act of happiness on the birth of Rasulullah that even though he was a certified Jahannami, Allah said no, even as a result of him celebrating that happiness on the birth of my beloved, give him relief in Jahannam. Even though he won't leave Jahannam, but give him relief in Jahannam so that people can know that if Abu Lahab in Jahannam can benefit from celebrating the birth of Rasulullah. What about the Mu'mineen who celebrate the birth of Rasulullah? So therefore, I have established quite clearly that the Prophet وسلم, used to not only uh, 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 the Quran and Sunnah not only extol the reverence of the day of birth and the benefits associated to it, but so much so that the Prophet وسلم, himself and his companions used to fast on that day. Now people say, well if you celebrate you should fast or you should fast also. The issue isn't fasting. The issue is, why did he fast? The issue isn't fasting. The issue is, why did he fast? The reason why the fasting was specified on Monday was because he was born on Monday. But then, if that is what he did, then what, that is what we should also do. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Why should we fast on Monday? The people of amongst the Salaf and the Khalaf used to uh, uh, fast on Monday. But... The significance of fasting is that when you fast on a Monday, it is a form of shukr. It is a form of thanks. So therefore, even though we may not fast on Monday, the fact that we extol his birthday and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessing is also in the constitution of celebrating Miladun Nabi sallallahu So therefore, the Quran and Sunnah have taught us that the day of birth of a Nabi is no ordinary day, it is a day of reverence, it is a day of significance, and the best way to celebrate that day is by sending salam. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself sends salam. I if you see the world around you, you will see that the Muslim world, the majority of the Muslims, even up till this time celebrate the milad of Rasulullah sallallahu Whichever country you go to, whichever city you go to, you will see. In fact, I recall in the 1980s when I used to come to Keithley as a child, I used to see milad, there was only 5, 10, 15, 20 people. There was so much literature and propaganda against milad. But the beautiful thing is, 30 years later, all of those U.S. Stroke Saudi dollars or pounds went down the gutter. Why? Because the more they suppress the celebration of Milad, the more Milad is being celebrated. <laughs> and today, you don't have now Milad celebrating in one city at one time. In one city, you have many celebrations of Milad. The point I want to make is that you look around the globe, look around the whole of the globe you will see quite clearly that the majority of the Ummah today celebrates Milad. And the Prophet has promised us that remember, La tajtami'u ummati ala dalalah. Or in another narration, La yajtami'u ummati ala dalalah. The majority of my nation will never ever be misguided. Why? The actions of the majority will always be on the right line. If you see the world today, you will see in every corner of the world, Milad is being celebrated. And the fact that the majority hold on to the celebration of Milad proves that this is not a source of misguidance. Why? The celebration is not decreasing day by day, it is increasing day by day. La yajtami ummati ala dalala. And so therefore, you can see. Now some people say you call this day a day of Eid. Again, I want to, uh, I have attempted to structure my discussion around the objections that have been raised. Some people say you structure, you call this day of Eid. You call this day a day of Eid. Eid Miladun Nabi. Why Eid? 
Because on Eve you can't fast. So if it was a day of Eve, then the Prophet wouldn't have fasted. You understand the question? They say, why did the Prophet fast? Can you fast on Eve? So why did the Prophet fast? So the fact that he fasted means it wasn't Eve. Because on Eve you can't fast. Only shaitan fasts on the day of Eve. So the Prophet they say, by his conduct, by fasting, dismiss the notion that this is the day of Eve. Well, firstly, I must specify that when we say Eid, there are two kinds of Eid. There's what you call Eid Fiqhi. Eid specified by Fiqh, which is specified on a particular, in a particular month, in a particular day, at a particular time. You can't read Eid Namaz. At Isha time, Eid Namaz has been specified. Eid day has been specified in the calendar, which day it comes. This Eid Fiqhi. But Eid Milad Nabi is not like the other Eids. It's not like the other Eids. It's actually better than the other Eids. Why? Because if we didn't have this Eid, we wouldn't have that Eid. It is only because we have this Eid that we have those two Eids. But when we say Eid, we don't mean Eid in the Eid Fiqhi sense. That it is Eid in Fiqhah. Why? If you don't celebrate Eid or if you deny the celebration of those two Eids, it is fisk, it is guna. But if a person doesn't celebrate the milani, he doesn't become a fisk, and he doesn't become a gunagar, fasid. But if he prohibits others from celebrating, then he becomes a gunagar. Then he becomes a fasid. Why? Because those who are celebrating, they are celebrating in alignment with the constitution of the Quran and Sunnah. So when we say Eid, why do we say Eid Milad Nabi? The reason why we specify it as Eid. Because where did the word Eid come from? It comes from the notion that when Allah revealed on this earth, Ni'ma, Allahumma Rabbana anzil alayna ma'idatan min as-sama. Isa salam says, Oh Allah, Reveal for, for us from the skies, maida, food. Takunu lana eidan li awwalina wa akhirina wa ayatam mink. Oh Allah, so that this day of Eid can become a sign for those who came before us and those who came right at the end. Wa ayatam mink. So it becomes a sign if the day of Eid was a day of significance when Isa salam re received food from the heavens. If that is the day of Eid, what about when the Ummah received from the heavens the greatest person that ever existed in this universe? So therefore, if food can be the day of Eid, the bringing of food from the heavens, that can be a day of Eid. Why can't the day of Rasulullah salam coming be a day of Eid? And finally, it is often said that yes, we accept that this is a, a, a excellent day, but it's only one day. It's only one day. He was born. That's it. That day is gone. Why do you celebrate every day or every year? Why do you give eminence to the same day year after year? You understand the last question? This is the last question I'm going to pose to you. What? Yes, there are certain people who say, yes, we accept. Okay, 12th of Rabbi But that day existed once in the whole of the universe. Why do you celebrate that day again and again and again and again? What is the significance of repeating that celebration? <clears throat> the answer is, there was a day, or should I say a night, when the Qur'an was revealed. And Allah said, that yes, it was revealed in one night. Although it was revealed over a period of 20 odd years. But that revelation was separate. When it was revealed in one form, in one night. Allah says, don't call that night an ordinary night. Why? Laylatul Qadr Khaylun Min. Al Fishal. It's better than a thousand nights. Why? Not same as a thousand nights. It's better than a thousand nights. 
So if the revelation of the Qur'an, the night of revelation of Qur'an is better than a thousand nights, what about the revelation of Sahih Qur'an, the one of the Qur'an? If that night, year after year after year, and by the way, some people say he was born on the night, some people say he was born on such, such and such a day, it doesn't matter. Why? Because when the Prophet announced that the Qur'an was revealed in the last part of Ramadan, in the odd nights, 21, 23, 25, 27, 29. He didn't specify the date. He didn't specify the date. So the Sahaba began to argue amongst themselves as to which was the correct night of revelation of the Quran. When they went to the Prophet, the Prophet said, was given wahi by Allah. Now that you have disputed the exact night amongst yourselves, you should have just followed what the Prophet said. Find that night in the last of nights of Ramadan. But because you argued Allah has now hidden that night from you. And therefore, the real knowledge of which night it was exactly was hidden. Although the consensus is 27, but the reality is, find it in the last odd nights of Ramadan when the Prophet ﷺ heard this he, instead of becoming sad he became happy why would he become happy? the real night has been taken away why? because if a person celebrates Laylatul Qadr on the 21st he will get the same reward on the 21st if he celebrates it on the 23rd he will get the same reward if he celebrates it on the 25th he will get the same reward and if he celebrates it on the 27th, he will get the same reward. Likewise, 29th. Why? The object is the Prophet said, of night, whichever of the of night, as long as your need is, I am commemorating this night as the night of Qadr on account of your need, Allah will give you a reward for your worship on that night. So, therefore, if that night, whichever night you specify in the last nights, of, Rabi of, of uh, Ramadan, whichever night you specify, you will be rewarded. Min khairum min al-fishar, whichever night you specify, if you will be rewarded. Therefore, if that reward exists for the revelation of the Quran, then it doesn't really matter if you specify the minar on the 12th of Rabi or on the 9th of Rabi or on the 13th of Rabi or whichever day, as long as you are near. Your intention is to specify the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You will automatically be rewarded on the basis of that niyyah. So I hope the topic that I have been given, which was to uh, uh, to shed light on the legitimacy of the celebration of Milad, I have indicated directly from the Quran and Sahih Hadith that the celebration of Milad is within the Ayin, within the constitution of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Anyone who dismisses this day to be an ordinary day, he is going against the spirit of the Qur'an and Sunnah. What we don't say is that if a person doesn't celebrate, he becomes a kafir or he becomes a fasting. But what we say is that if a person says that anyone who celebrates commits fisk, then he himself is uh, 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 evoking fisk uh, good out from himself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow me and you to celebrate this birth with knowing the significance of this day and by knowing the significance of the day for us to extract the real benefit of this day and what is the ultimate benefit of this day? The ultimate benefit is when you celebrate the birthday of someone, you celebrate it to participate in his happiness so that he knows that you attended his birthday. If you attend the birthday of any ordinary person with that niya, then you should celebrate the same, you should celebrate the birthday of the Prophet with the same niya. That when you come here, you should know that you are celebrating it to please him, you are celebrating it for him to forge and to strengthen your contact with him. May Allah give us success in this respect. So, I have another five minutes. Uh, 
I have concluded the subject which I wanted to bring to you. This is a topic that I was given. However, if there are any questions, you may ask if you so wish. I know there's no culture of questions and answers, but it's a good thing. Why? Because asking questions is also the sunnah of the sunnah. Any questions? Can you tell other people's paper going around Or well, if you don't want to write your question, you can stand up, no problem. <coughs> Once the questions are being asked, let me tell you that the beautiful thing is that you will see in the history, in the 1300 years of history, many eminent ulama have written on the significance of the celebration of Milan. However, one in particular that I would like to highlight in front of you is, do you know, I don't know whether you know, but do you know the uh, school of thought known as Dioban? Do you know the school of thought known as Dioban? The spiritual master of this whole school, the spiritual master, the greatest being, the greatest mushad in the school of Dioban, his name was Haji Imdallah Mahadil Baki. All of these ulama of Dioban are murid of Haji Sahib. Whether it's Qasim Nanotmi or whether it's uh, Khalil Ahmed al Baitri, Rashid Ahmed al they are all murids of Hadisa. Hadisa was the peer of Murshid of all of these people. And the ulama of Dioban refer and respect Haji Imdadullah Mahad al Makki, to whom we even say, Rahmatullah alayh. But the beautiful thing is, Haji Imdadullah Mahad al Makki not only used to celebrate Milan, he wrote a book on the celebration of Milan. <laughs> Those who say that no, 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 this is a new thing, they should consult their spiritual master. Their spiritual master used to extol, not only extol, he used to practice. And in the celebration of Milad, he used to stand and read Salatu Salam. <coughs> so therefore, we can see, and then if you look at the eminent figures in the south, uh, in the uh, in the Asian subcontinent, Shah Abdullah Muhammad Dehli, everyone accepts his authority. All the Ahlus Sunnah, all the Ahlus Sunnah accept his authority. Shah Abdul Aziz Muhammad Dehli. Shah Abdul Haq Mohandas Dehri, Shah Ismail Mohandas Dehri, Mujaddad Al Fasani Sheikh Abdul Sadiqi. You look at all of the Shayukh, all of the Awliya, all of them have not only celebrated but they've written books and literature on the celebration of Milad of the Prophet. <coughs> and in fact, Ibn Kasir. Ibn Kasir, who even the selfies accept as an authority, Ibn Kasir has written praises of the king, Muzaffar, who used to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ. Instead of condemning him, Ibn Kasir has written his praise that he used to celebrate the birthday of Rasulullah ﷺ. People say that if Sahaba didn't celebrate the Milad, then how can we? Well, in terms of celebration, the Sharia does not specify how to celebrate. It says that it's a day of eminence, it's a day of reverence, but it doesn't specify how. But what the Sahaba did used to do, including the Prophet is give the day reverence. <laughs> Once we have established that that day is a day of reverence, the battle is over. Why? Because if you've accepted that the day of birth is a day of reverence, then how you celebrate it is, 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 is insignificant. Why? Because the, as long as the manner of celebration is within 
the precinct of the Quran and Sunnah. That's fine. As long as how you celebrate, I have never attended a milad where people have been dancing. I have never celebrated a milad where people have been committing acts against the Sharia. When we celebrate milad, what is it that we do in this celebration? We uh, uh, say Tarawat of the Quran. We say Naat and uh, Nasheed. We have lectures. We say Salat al Salam. Which element of this celebration is against the Quran and Sunnah? So, therefore, if a person accepts that this is a day of reverence, a day of significance, as I have demonstrated from the Quran and Sunnah, and as the Sahaba used to practice, not only on a yearly basis, but on a weekly basis, then we can accept that the Sahaba not only celebrated it yearly, they celebrated it consistently. And the best way to celebrate is by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was by fasting and other means. <coughs> is, is there anything wrong with putting lights and flags up to celebrate the Milad? I mean, there's another uh, uh, thing here. Is it permissible to celebrate individual birthdays? Some people, I just want to say before I answer this question, some, there's a, because I always like to structure my uh, uh, discourses around the objections. Because people often say, well, you just come and give your point of view and then you go away and we're, we're left to deal with their objections. Some, this is a trick of the trade. You heard the trick of the trade. Yeah? Every trade has tricks in it. And in the world of Ilam, there's many tricks also. What they say is, no, no, we shouldn't celebrate the birthday of the Prophet because this imitates the Kuffar, the Nasara, the Yehud and Nasara. Why? Because they celebrate Christmas, and if we celebrate the birthday of the Prophet we're imitating them. And they use the month the Shabba Abi Qawmin for a minu. He who imitates the nation is one like them. This is a trick of the trade. Be careful. Why? Because there are many fake products in the market. And they use this excuse to, and they, then they bring the hadith where the Prophet says, Don't imitate the uh, Yahud and the Nasara. And they say, Look, they used to celebrate the birthday of Isa. Therefore, by us celebrating uh, Mila, they're imitating the Yahud and the Nasara. This is their, if, if you hear their lectures or if you hear their, uh, 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 their rhetoric, this is what they come out with. Let me be very clear to you. Firstly and foremost, the Yehud and the Nasara, please pay attention to me. The Yehud and the Nasara do not celebrate the birthday of Isa and Islam, Musa and Islam. Have you ever heard the Yehud celebrating the birthday of Musa and Islam? In fact, Christmas is not even the birthday of Isa and Islam. For anyone to say that Christmas is the birth of what is Christmas? Christ Mass. It's just a Mass in the name of Christ. The actual birthday of Isa al-Islam wasn't even on the 25th of December. In fact, if you look at this in more detail, you will realize that the actual origin of the Christmas itself has got nothing to do with Christianity. It's of pagan origin. I'm not going to go into detail. There's a lot of literature out there. But the reality is that even if you say that no, their intention is to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet well, the Hadith doesn't say that don't imitate the Yehud and the, and the Sara because they celebrated birthday. It says don't imitate them. Why? Because they elevated their Prophet in praise to the extent that they made Isa salam, the Son of God. So don't elevate my praise to the extent that you make me the Son of God. Why am I not the Son of God? Allah has no children. Lam yulad. So therefore, this is a trick of the trade. They say, well, you're copying them. We don't copy them. Why? Because their Christmas has got nothing to do with the birthday of Isa alayhi salam. Our celebration of Milad is a, a, a day when we specify the significance and the reverence of his birthday so that we can thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, putting up lights and putting up flags, well, it's a form of happiness. Imam Qastalani in his Mawahib al dunya says that when the birth of the Prophet وسلم, the birthday came about, Allah told the angels to light up the heavens 
with more lighting to commemorate the birthday of Rasulullah. Not only that, Imam Ibn Qasim writes in Al Badaya Wal Nihaya. You talk about putting lights on the birthday of the Prophet's birth? The Prophet وسلم, when he was born, his mother said, Kharaja binni nurun Allah minhuma bain al mashriki wal maghrib. When I gave birth, I gave birth, I saw a light emanated from me. The east and the west were one for me, i.e. such was the caliber of the light, I saw the east and the west in front of me. So the light or lighting on the birth of the Rasulullah and this hadith by the way, for your record, is uh, 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 brought even by Imam Ibn Kasir. So you can imagine that this is a source of authority. Not only Imam Qastalani in his Mahabila Dunya brings this, is it permissible to celebrate the birthdays of individuals as long as that celebration does not contravene the Quran and the Sunnah? If that celebration means that you're going to have a party where people are going to come and dance, that's haram. But as long as the celebration is there to commemorate the birth and to thank Allah, to do dua on that day, there is no harm in celebration as long as it is within the eye of the uh, uh, Sunnah. <coughs> do you know when we read Mawlid and stand up uh, from sitting position, some people say we disrespect the Prophet ﷺ just by standing. Could you please mention the fact, please. Could you mention the fact, please? The fact, in it? It's up north. The fact. Uh, you can laugh. Um, standing up. What is the significance? Some people say you read salam sitting down. Why stand up? Is everyone here? Listen. Yes. There's sometimes when I look around, not only here, this is a trend, where people's faces are as if they're in the crown court in the dock. They're being done as well. They're looking at them. They for goodness sake, you can't smile. You know, there's, no, there's no fatwa on you for smiling in the house of Allah. Right. Standing up. Why is it important to stand up as opposed to sit down? We don't mind you can sit down when you say salam. But, which is a mark of respect? Sitting down or standing up? Why? Because, who taught us to stand up out of respect? Who taught us to stand up out of respect? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa One day, he was sitting down. He was? Oh, come on. He was? Sitting down. Alright, he was sitting down. That's your local accent, isn't it? He was sitting down. He was sitting down. He saw a janazah pass by him. This is in Bukhari. Baru Janais. He saw a janazah funeral pass by him. The funeral passed by him. He was sitting there and he stood up. He stood up. <coughs> Out of respect. So much so that the next time he says that the funeral was the funeral of a Jew. It wasn't even a Muslim. Right there. Here the Prophet is standing up upon the, seeing the funeral of a Jew. Not only that, the Prophet said, Ida ra'aytum janazatan faqoomu. If any one of you sees a janazah, stand up. Here we have a problem. Some people say, no, no, you stand up to someone who is living, fine. But stand up for someone who is dead. The Prophet is teaching us that you can stand up for someone who is dead. Why? Because standing up is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The words of Bukhari, stand up. Now in case, because this is being recorded, someone goes back and does research on the studies. Someone has seen them written, it means standing up not for the person who is dead, but standing up for the angels who are around the dead person. It doesn't really matter which way you look at it. Standing up for a dead person or standing up for the angel, the Prophet is still, still teaching us, stand up is a stand up, whether you stand up for the dead person or for the angel, standing up is a posture of respect. So therefore, standing up is the sunnah of Rasulullah 
as a mark of respect. Yes, there is a hadith that the Prophet came into a room and the people stood up and he said, La, li, don't stand for me. But that is a sign of humility. That doesn't mean to say that now the Prophet forbidden us. Why? Because on the one hand he says, La, li, don't stand for me. But on the other hand he says, Stand up for your elders. So therefore, standing up is a posture of respect. It is better than sitting down. Even though there's someone who can't stand up, if he's sitting down, that is also a mark of respect. We don't say sitting down is disrespect. We say standing up is a better mark of respect. And here, one question is, are women allowed to go to the graveyard? If you consult the classical Hanafi position, the classical Hanafi position is no. But if you look at the general Quran and Sunnah on this subject, the Prophet said, Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyaratul qubur. I used to prohibit you from the visitation of the graves. Al ana after today, fuzuruha, I command you to visit graves. There's no restriction. However, the Prophet also said in the Sayyid Hadith, Laknatun ala zavvara. May Allah curse those women who consistently visit the grave. I, who uh, visit uh, uh, um, uh, beyond the norm, who unreasonably visit, zavvara, who visit unreasonably, again and again. Why? Because the object is to remember death. The object is to uh, give them Isa al sawab But if a, if a person goes there again and again, cries, cries, this is not desirable by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, if Lanatun al zawara was the basis of an absolute prohibition on women visiting graves, then why was it that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, the rule is where a Nabi passes away, you must bury him where he passes away. Why is it that when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he passed away in the house of Sayyidah Aisha anha. They buried him in the same house. No one said to Hazrat Aisha, now, Amadi, there's a grave here. Yeah? Can you pack your bags and leave? No. She stayed in the same house and she continued to stay. In fact, she said, when I used to visit, when I used to go outside, I used to have my hijab on. When I used to come inside, I used to take my hijab off. Why? Because this grave is the grave of no ordinary person, he's my husband. I don't have to keep my hijab in front of him. When Abu Bakr Siddiq was buried in the house of Sayyidah Aisha, no one said to her, excuse me, now it's a graveyard, yeah? Now, you must move away from here. How can you go there? No. She still lived in the same, talk about visiting grave, she lived in the graveyard. Yeah, she lived in the graveyard. And she lived there, no one removed her. In fact, she said, when I used to go outside, I used to wear my hijab. When I used to come inside, I used to take my hijab off. Why? Here is the grave of my husband and here is the grave of my father. There is no hijab from your father. However, when Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu was buried there, again, no one told her, now you should pack your bags. No. She continued to live there. However, when she would come indoors, she would not take her hijab off. Why? Because although the Prophet ﷺ was her mahram, Abu Bakr Siddiq was her mahram, Umar Farooq was not her mahram. That is why she used to keep her hijab on even in the house. So if there was a prohibition, an absolute prohibition on the visitation of graves, then why would say that Aisha and Yenna forget visiting graves? Why would she live? There. I hope that clarifies it in this issue. But the classical Hanafi position on this is a prohibition emanating from the order of Sayyidina Umar Farooq. Um, then it's uh, this hadith. Can you explain what is meant by there are 73 sects and only one sect will go to heaven? Who are the one sect that will go to heaven and how do we know we are right? Well, it doesn't say on your forehead, we are right. What does it say outside the mosque? Please don't come into this mosque, we are wrong. No one's going to say that, are they? Everyone's going to say, we are right, we are right. We are right. But the Prophet ﷺ decided who is right. Rather than us deciding who is right. The first, this hadith, if you look at the context of the hadith, he said, Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. Those who are right are on 
my boss and the boss of mine? Oh, come on. My boss of mine? To so those who don't believe in Zamba, the Prophet has cut them out. So people who say, we don't believe in Zamba. Zamba are not good people. We say, thank you very much. Why? Because they're showing that they're not from the right group. The Prophet has cut them out. Those who don't believe in Zahaba, they are not on the right path. The people of the right path are people who believe in the Sahaba. Okay, so that's she has that window. Now we're left with the other sort of There are those who say, we believe in Sahaba, we believe in Sahaba. How do you distinguish between those who say they believe in Sahaba and those who don't believe in Sahaba? I can give you a number of items of evidence to show who are the real followers of Sahaba. <coughs> who are the real followers of Sahaba and who are the fake followers of Sahaba? Allah says in the Quran, very simply, <laughs> When Allah guides someone, then He is guided. However, the sign of someone who is misguided, when we misguide someone, he cannot find a value or a mushad. So one of the signs of the followers of the Sahaba are those who follow the awliya and who have mushad. Those who don't follow the Sahaba in the real sense, they have no mushad and they have no wali. Those who follow awliya are the people of the Ahle Sunnah. That is why the Ahle Sunnah, that is why the Ahle Sunnah are the ones who have called the Oriya. You will never find a Wahhabi Wali. You will never find. If there is a Wahhabi Wali in the world, my challenge is let him come in front of me and show his Wali in front of me. Why? Whether it is Murtaza Khan or Bin Baz from his grave, no one can show a Wali. Who is Wahhabi al the Salafi? If he is, my challenge is bring him in front of me and tell him to say to people that I am a Mali and we will test his Wali. Why? If you look at the Ahl Sunnah, we don't have one Wali, we have a whole catalog of Awliya. It is only the Ahl Sunnah who have the Awliya. Why? Because to be a Wali, you can only be in the group of the Ahl Sunnah. Because all the awliya were from the Ahl Sunnah, even the Shahanshah Walaya, the king of awliya, Sayyidina Ali, I am from the Ahl Sunnah. So if the king is from the Ahl Sunnah, then it means all the followers are also from the Ahl Sunnah. This isn't a, a, a munaza based on uh, uh, speeches or lectures or, oh brother, we should do this. Bring it on. Bring your bunnies in front of us and we'll show you whether they are bunnies or not. This is not just a, an intellectual exercise. Bring it on and show us who are your awliya and let's test their malaya. If they are able to prove their malaya, then we will accept that you are on the right path. But the, uh, but the, uh, uh, the iconic element of the Ahl Sunnah is we don't just have the correct Aqeedah. We have those who are the followers of the correct Aqeedah who demonstrated that their Aqeedah took them places. And where did it take them? It took them to the domain of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where they gained Malaya. So therefore, the sign of the true safe sect are that they are the people who house the awliya of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Right. What is the best way for the Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah? Carry on fighting. Carry on with politics. That's what you want to hear, isn't it? I travel all over the world, and that's all I see Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah do. Fighting with each other, politics. He did this, he said, she said. That's all we're good for. That's all we can do. But if you really want to know the best way forward, the best way forward is that you must appreciate that your Nabi is living. If, you're, if you don't appreciate that he's living, you know when a father dies, the children fight. Why? Because they know the father's dead. What can he do? The Ahl Sunnah believe that the Prophet Sallallahu is living. And if you believe he is living, then don't harm your fellow Ummati. Why? 
whether he can answer you or not, you must know his answer is insignificant. What is more important is if you harm an ummati, you will be harming or you will be causing hurt to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So the only way to unite is for you to know that your Nabi is living, he is looking at you and then unite in the name of his love. And that is the best form of unity. Wama alayna illa al-balagul mubi.